Hi, this is Nathan Oxenfeld with Integral Eyesight Improvement. I'm here in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm currently traveling in New Zealand and Australia, collaborating with another vision educator to put together a new program designed specifically for children's vision with a special emphasis on technology and maintaining eye health as children are being introduced to screens earlier and earlier in life. I get a lot of questions from parents and teachers about that topic, so I'm actually really excited to be working on this and putting this together, so I'll be updating you with that as it comes together, so stay tuned for that. But today, I wanna speak specifically to you about a practice called shifting. Shifting is a crucial component of the Bates Method, and Dr. Bates actually has an entire chapter in his book, Perfect Sight Without Glasses, devoted to shifting and swinging. What I want to do today is read a few short excerpts from that chapter and explain them a little bit and actually walk you through some practicing of shifting so you can have an experience with it and eventually turn it into a new vision habit that replaces the bad vision habit, which is the opposite of shifting. Any guesses of what that might be? It's staring. And I've actually got a whole separate video about the importance of movement and how you need to be aware of the stare. And shifting is gonna be just another way to break that bad vision habit of staring. So the simplest way you can understand what shifting is, is it's really just shifting your point of focus from one point to another. It is the movement of your eyes, whereas staring is the lack of movement. When you stare, you kind of park your eyes on one thing and they don't move. They're frozen, they're stuck. And that creates a lot of strain and tension and blur, actually, which is important because I used to stare a lot and I used to associate staring with focusing. I thought if I had to focus on something, I needed to stare at it and try really hard to focus on it. But shifting is kind of the opposite of that. If you need to see something or focus on something, you actually, your eyes need to shift and move around in order to accommodate or focus. So let's hear a little bit about what Dr. Bates has to say about what shifting is. This is from chapter 15 of his book, Perfect Sight Without Glasses. When the eye with normal vision regards a letter, either at the near point or at the distance, the letter may appear to pulsate or to move in various directions, from side to side, up and down, or obliquely. When it looks from one letter to another on the Snell and Test card, or eye chart, or from one side of a letter to another, not only the letter, but the whole line of letters and the whole card may appear to move from side to side. This apparent movement is due to the shifting of the eye and is always in a direction contrary to the movement. If one looks at the top of a letter, the letter is below the line of vision and therefore appears to move downward. If one looks at the bottom, the letter is above the line of vision and appears to move upward. If one looks to the left of the letter, it is to the right of the line of vision and appears to move to the right. If one looks to the right, it is to the left of the line of vision and appears to move to the left. So right away, Dr. Bates points out that people with normal perfect vision actually shift their eyes a lot. And when they look at an eye chart or anything really, it may actually appear to move or pulsate. Whereas people with imperfect vision or blurry vision their vision is a lot more static. Their eyes are rigid. They don't move as much. And when you look at an eye chart or something, it actually appears to be totally stationary, no movement at all. So this is one way that you can be working with an eye chart. And that's another question I get a lot about is, what do I do with my eye chart? How do I use my eye chart? Well, the eye chart is a really good training ground for learning how to shift. So I've got my eye chart on my shirt here. So using the O in between the Y and the C, 
If you're looking at the top of the O or above the O, where is the O? It is in your lower peripheral vision. And when you shift your eyes from above the O to below the O, where is the O now? It's not below your central vision anymore, now it's in your upper peripheral vision. So as you go from top to bottom, it's almost like the O goes up a little bit. So your eyes go down, the O goes up. It goes in the opposite direction that your eyes move. If you're looking over at the U, where is the O? It's off to your left. It's in your left peripheral field. If you shift over to the Y, now where is the O? It's not on your left side anymore. It's over to the right. So as you shift to the left, the O appears to move to the right. This is called oppositional movement. And this is actually something that the long swing is trying to teach you. I have a separate video that teaches the long swing where you're moving your whole body a large distance and you're trying to notice things move in the opposite direction that you're moving. Shifting is kind of like the miniature version of that. You might benefit from moving your head a little bit, doing like a little short swing or maybe swaying your body um, but even if you're keeping everything still and it's just your eyes shifting, it's still possible to perceive that illusion. It's an optical illusion of oppositional movement. So let's go on and see what else he has to say about this. It is impossible for the eye to fix a point longer than a fraction of a second. If it tries to do so, it begins to strain and the vision is lowered. This can readily be demonstrated by trying to hold one part of a letter for an appreciable length of time. No matter how good the sight, it will begin to blur, or even disappear, very quickly. And sometimes the effort to hold it will produce pain. In the case of a few exceptional people, a point may appear to be held for a considerable length of time. The subjects themselves may think that they are holding it, but this is only because the eye shifts unconsciously. The movements being so rapid that objects seem to be seen all alike simultaneously. The eye with imperfect sight tries to accomplish the impossible by looking fixedly at one point for an appreciable length of time. That is, by staring. When it looks at a strange letter and does not see it, it keeps on looking at it in an effort to see it better. Now, I remember the first time I read this, it really struck a chord with me because he was speaking exactly to my personal experience before I had ever knew about the Bates Method or any of this vision stuff. I remember when I was younger in school, sometimes if I was bored, I would stare at the teacher in the front of the classroom or at one point on the chalkboard. And I noticed that after five or 10 or 15 seconds of staring and not blinking, not shifting, I would actually start to notice parts of my visual field disappearing. Mainly in my peripheral vision, it was almost like I got this tunnel vision. And right when I would blink or shift or move, my visual field would come back. That's exactly what he's describing here. I mean, you can even demonstrate it to yourself if you really want to. I, I don't really encourage it because staring is bad for you. But if you do stare at one point on the screen or one object in your room or one letter on an eye chart for a long enough time without blinking and without shifting, your vision gets worse. You might even lose part of your vision temporarily, but then right when you shift, right when you blink, it reappears. So sometimes it actually is good to demonstrate that to yourself, that staring makes your vision worse. And shifting, therefore, makes your vision better. Now, I love that last sentence, though. When you look at something and you do not see it, a lot of people keep on looking at it in an effort to see it better. And that is the wrong thing to do. It's a natural thing to do, right? If you can't see something, you think, oh, well, I, I must have to keep looking at it and keep trying harder until I see it or until I focus. But I'm going to invite you to try something the opposite. 
look away from that thing that you cannot see clearly and then come back. In other words, shift away and shift back. Or you can shift around it. If you're looking at a letter on the eye chart and it's not clear, don't just stare at it and squint and strain and try really hard. Shift. Either blink or go above and below or side to side or maybe look at something else, you know, look out the window and then come back and check and see, okay, now can I see it? If yes, that's great. You just had a clear flash. You just improved your vision in that moment. If not, if it's still blurry, try and shift somewhere else. Look above or below. You, you have to keep trying and experimenting without effort or strain. So instead of staring, Dr. Bates writes, one of the best methods of improving the sight, therefore, is to imitate consciously the unconscious shifting of normal vision and to realize the apparent motion produced by such shifting. Whether one has imperfect or normal sight, conscious shifting and swinging are a great help and advantage to the eye. For not only may imperfect sight be improved in this way, but normal sight may be improved also. When the sight is imperfect, shifting, if done properly, rests the eye as much as palming and always lessens or corrects the error of refraction. So I have a whole nother video about palming, which is a very relaxing practice to relax the tight eye muscles and loosen them and, and reduce your eye strain. But Dr. Bates just pointed out that when you do shifting properly, it actually rests your eye as much as palming does. For a lot of other parts of your body, you would actually think that the lack of movement would be relaxing and restful. But when it comes to your eyes, it's actually the opposite. Your eyes are much more rested and relaxed when they're moving and shifting. So it's important to note that he points out that shifting is actually an unconscious thing. It's actually an involuntary thing that your eyes naturally want to be doing. And it's what people who have good vision already, their eyes are already doing it without them even knowing it. But if you have imperfect sight, your job is to practice conscious shifting, consciously doing it enough until it sinks down and becomes unconscious again. It becomes the new way you use your eyes all the time. And the reason I love shifting so much is because it's so subtle. It's something that you can be doing without anybody even knowing you're doing it. And you can be doing it while you're doing other activities. For example, while you're watching this video, you can be practicing shifting. You can be shifting from me to the sky tower out the window and then back. Or maybe you can practice shifting between my eyes or you can be shifting around on the letters on my eye chart shirt so that you're actually practicing your vision while watching this video. The main thing you're looking for, you're not just sitting there moving your eyes around a lot you know, as fast as you can. It's easy, soft, gentle movements and you're trying to notice, okay, does it kind of look like the things on the screen are moving in the opposite direction? Or maybe you want to shift away from the screen. Maybe you want to look out a window where you are. Or maybe you want to look at something else in the room. You shift away from the screen and you shift back. You shift over here and you shift back. Also keep in mind that blinking creates shifting. So even if you are looking at me or one point on the screen for an extended period of time, as long as you're blinking every few seconds, you are not staring. You're actually shifting. And you may even be able to notice that each time you blink, it creates a little bit of movement. It almost kind of looks like your vision kind of wobbles or shakes a little bit each time you blink. And that way you can turn blinking into a vision practice as well. So let's go on here. He says, after resting the eyes by closing or palming, shifting and swinging are often more successful. By this method of alternately resting the eyes and then shifting, 
Persons with imperfect sight have sometimes obtained a temporary or permanent cure in a few weeks. So it's not just about shifting all the time. You also want to take little breaks, palm them or just close them, give them a little break and then open your eyes back up and go right back into shifting. So if shifting ever feels a little uncomfortable or tiring or exhausting at first, don't overdo it. Close your eyes, take a little break. Give your eyes plenty of rest. But the cool thing is, is that you might actually be even better at shifting with your eyes closed. He writes, a mental picture of a letter can be made to swing precisely as can a letter on the test card. Occasionally, one meets a patient with whom the reverse is true, but for most patients, the mental swing is easier at first than visual swinging. And when they become able to swing in this way, it becomes easier for them to swing the letters on the test card. By alternating mental with visual swinging and shifting, rapid progress is sometimes made. So now he's distinguishing between mental swinging and visual swinging. So mental swinging is when you close your eyes and you imagine something swinging in the opposite direction. So take the letter O with you into your memory. So you think of, you close your eyes, you picture a letter O out in front of you. It can be off in the distance, it can be up close, it can be floating in the air, it doesn't really matter. But the O is out there in front of you, your eyes are closed. This is purely mentally, not visually, mentally. And you think about the left side of the O and you think about the right side of the O. Or maybe you even go off to the left of the O and off to the right, back and forth. And as you're moving your mind, you're starting to imagine the O moving in the opposite direction. Maybe you can try vertical mental swinging. So you think about the top of the O and then the bottom of the O, or you go above the O and below the O, back and forth, and whichever way your mind is moving, the O moves in the opposite way. So you shift from bottom to top, the O goes down. You shift from top to bottom, the O goes up. Like Bates says, a lot of people find this actually easier to do it mentally first, and then you alternate, you open your eyes back up, and you try it visually. You go up and down or side to side, and maybe after seeing it happen in your head first, it actually appears better with your eyes open. And I mean, you can either try this on my little chart on my shirt, or it's going to be better if you have your own chart that you have hung up and you can actually try it. Uh, or maybe you already have some poster or something with words on your wall, or maybe you can even use some of the words or letters on the screen. And if you're not getting it right away, that's okay. Just practice it and be patient with it. And maybe you haven't practiced the long swing enough because the purpose of the long swing is to get a lot of big oppositional movement. It should be easy for you to see things moving in the opposite direction as you're doing a big body swing or a big head swing. But what we're talking about today is much more subtle. Maybe your head is moving just a tiny, tiny bit, or maybe it's just your eyes moving. And so a lot of people find it a little more difficult to notice the oppositional movement in the shifting or the short swing versus the bigger ones but it's really important that you keep practicing it and getting this. And if you're not getting it, maybe this will explain why. Dr. Bates writes, there is but one cause of failure to produce a swing, and that is strain. Some people try to make the letters swing by effort. Such efforts always fail. The eyes and mind do not swing the letters. They swing of themselves. Okay, so you don't have to try to make the letters move and you don't have to try to make your eyes move. Your eyes want to shift and swing by themselves and they're gonna do a much better job of that if you're just staying relaxed, you're keeping your eyes soft, you're not trying too hard and you're having kind of fun with it. You're not taking it too seriously, not trying to make it all happen. It's, it's only gonna happen if you're relaxed because strain is the only cause of failure. 
And I remember when I first was learning about shifting and I was reading how your, your eyes always have to be moving and you're never allowed to stare. It, I felt kind of like it was going to be exhausting to be always having to move my eyes around all day long, you know, thousands and thousands of times a day. But that's not how this works. I had to realize that, wait a second, I don't have to control the shifting or the swinging. All I have to do is relax. And the more relaxed I get, the more my eyes will start to shift on their own. So make sure you're not trying too hard or straining or putting effort into your shifting. So in this chapter, Dr. Bates gives six or seven or eight different examples of how to practice this. So I'm going to read one of them. He says, the following methods of shifting have been found useful in various cases. Number one, regard a letter. Shift to a letter on the same line far enough away so that the first is seen worse. So you shift from the Y over to the U. And when you're on the U, can you notice that the Y looks worse than the U does? Then look back at letter number one and see letter number two worse. So when you're back on the Y, does the U look worse than the Y does? Look at the letters alternately for a few seconds, seeing worse the one not regarded. So when you look at the Y, the U looks worse. When you look at the U, the Y looks worse. And you're alternating, shifting between one letter and the other. Now, if these letters are too small or too close together to notice one looks worse, like I said, you might want to try it with a bigger eye chart. And, and make it work for you. Or maybe you want to use two different objects. So you can shift from me to the sky tower. And when you're looking at the sky tower, my face should look worse. You shouldn't see as many details on my face. When you shift back to my face, then the details come back and the sky tower looks worse. So you're alternating, shifting between one object and another, noticing that you can only see one object best at a time. And if you're familiar with this concept, that's called central fixation or centralization. So shifting and centralizing have a lot in common and they depend upon each other. So this is one example of something you can do to use your eye chart for, to practice shifting and to practice centralizing, demonstrating to yourself that when you look at one letter, the other letter looks worse. And as you're shifting around the chart, can you notice that oppositional movement? The letters look like they're pulsating or moving in the opposite way your eyes are moving. So he gives a, a handful of other examples that I'd encourage you to check out and, and experiment with, but I'm gonna finish up video here by reading this last paragraph. He says, when it is not possible to practice with the Snellen test card, other objects may be utilized. One can shift, for instance, from one window of a distant building to another or from one part of a window to another part of the same window, from one auto to another, or from one part of an auto to another part, producing in each case the illusion that the objects are moving in a direction contrary to the movement of the eye. When talking to people, one can shift from one person to another or from one part of the face to another part. When reading a book or newspaper, one can shift consciously from one word or letter to another, or from one part of a letter to another. The eye chart is a really good thing to practice this on, but it's not just a chart practice. You're supposed to be shifting all day long on all kinds of objects, buildings, windows, cars, people, print. It's just a matter of noticing the oppositional movement. And the better you get at noticing that, the more this is going to become ingrained as a good vision habit that you can maintain all day long. So then you don't even have to spend as much time doing Bates method practices because you are shifting all day long. And Dr. Bates also said that you're supposed to Imagine seeing things moving all day long from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night. 
And even when you're falling asleep at night, you can be thinking about things moving as well. So remember, it's not just the physical or visual movement, it's also the mental movement. So one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this topic in this video is to expand your understanding of the swinging. A lot of people think that swinging, when they hear swinging from the Bates method or when you talk about me swinging, you only think about the long swing. And that's not all swinging is. The purpose of the long swing is actually to get better at the short swing, to get better at shifting. And eventually, you won't even have to do the long swing anymore because you'll get as much relaxation, if not more, from doing a short swing or a short shift. And you can be doing that all day long while you're at school, while you're at work, while you're with friends. Your eyes are moving all day long anyway. It's your job to notice the oppositional movement and notice if there's any resistance to that. Because a lot of my students, when I teach them this, they have a little resistance to it. I'm asking them to notice my head moving on the screen or the letters moving on their chart, but they say, they're not moving. I know they're staying still. I know the computer is not actually moving. I'm moving. And yeah, that is true, but that's actually a form of strain of trying to keep things totally stationary. So the better you get at opening up to this illusion and noticing the apparent oppositional movement of things all day long, it's actually helping you relax more. And it's helping you get this as a good vision habit. So if you've only been doing the long swing so far and you have not done any kind of medium swing or short swing or shifting, I'd encourage you to try shifting in that direction and getting better at these more subtle movements. And if you practice the conscious shifting enough every day for the next week or two weeks or a month, before you know it, it's gonna become unconscious. You're going to successfully break the bad habit of staring and replace it with the good habit of shifting. And that's what we're trying to do with this whole Bates Method process, is we're trying to replace our bad vision habits with good vision habits. So let me know how your shifting is coming in the comments. If you're seeing the little oppositional movement or if it's a challenge, if you can do it with your eyes closed better than you can do it with your eyes open. And if the shifting and the blinking and the centralizing is actually giving you moments of clarity, if it's giving you clear flashes. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. The, the more you learn how to move, the better your eyes get at focusing and seeing things clearly without glasses. So the next time you can't see something clearly without your glasses on, instead of staring at it and putting a lot of effort and strain into it, try shifting. Look away, come back, do some blinking. Maybe close your eyes, rest your eyes, do some mental swinging of that object, and then open your eyes back up to check to see if you get a clear flash. And once you start getting clear flashes every single day, it's only a matter of time until that becomes your new normal vision. So as always, you can learn more about this topic on my website, integraleyesight.com. If you need some more help with any of these topics that I cover in these videos, I'd encourage you to either check out my online program, the Holistic Vision Program, or to consider working with me individually as your vision coach to help you figure all this stuff out and apply it to your everyday life and to answer all your questions in depth so that we get that one-on-one -on -one interaction. That's usually how people get the best results from this. And if you haven't checked it out already, check out my podcast, The Naked Eye Podcast, where I talk about these topics in even more depth and the next episode I'll be releasing is probably going to be one leading you through more practices in an audio format. So you don't even have to watch a video. You can just listen and follow along as I guide you through some interactive vision practices. So you can find those episodes on my website or 
if you search the Naked Eye podcast in any podcast app, it'll come right up. So subscribe to that. Make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel because I'm going to be releasing more content, hopefully as I'm traveling through New Zealand and Australia and then beyond. I also release a monthly email newsletter called Eyesight Insights where I'm always sending out new vision tips and updates and events that I'm doing because I'm traveling around a lot and teaching workshops and classes and opportunities to to meet me in person. So if you haven't subscribed to that, you might want to head over to my website and check that out. Um, I'm also on Instagram posting pictures and updates from my travels. So if you're on Instagram, follow me at Integral Eyesight. So lots of different ways to get involved and to keep working on achieving better, healthier vision naturally, without glasses, without contacts, without surgery. So thank you so much for taking some time today to learn about holistic eye care and the Bates Method. And until next time, happy shifting.